you know what? I'm somebody that if I say I'm going to do something, I mean, I'm going to do it. And when I was around eight months pregnant, I went in to see this doctor and told her what I was planning on doing. And she turned to me and said, you going to university and getting a degree would be like you going to the Olympics and winning a gold medal. Welcome to The Carla Rand Show, a weekly podcast designed to dig into the lives of everyday people. People who are making a positive impact, people who have risen above and overcome obstacles. Insights and stories from ordinary individuals who inspire us all towards the truly extraordinary. Here's your host. Hey, it's Carla, and I just got to talk to Jennifer Domville. And Jennifer and I connected because she was trying to sell me something, but she didn't come across that way. And I get people all the time, like, trying to sell me stuff. You know, you probably do too on your messenger. And so at first I'm just like, yeah, whatever. But she was persistent, and she was so sweet about it. And so I'm like, okay, like, I gotta, like, get to know this girl a bit. Like, she's so persistent. She's so good at marketing. So I kept kind of going back and forth with her. And finally we got on a conversation, we got on a call, and had a really good conversation. And I found out like all kinds of stuff about her life. And I thought, I got to have you on my podcast. So she's gone through, she was an alcohol, an alcoholic. So she went through all of that. She was able to quit that. She has been sober for 15 years. She also has a daughter who is an addict. So she's had to deal with that really, really trying times. And there isn't even a happy ending. Like her daughter is still in the same predicament. And yet she's able to continue on with her life. She's raising her own son. She's also raising two of her grandchildren and, um, running her own home business. So she's very successful at what she does. She connects, she loves, she's very kind and just a really interesting and really successful person that I would love for you to hear just her story. So let's uh, let's get into the conversation and I know that you're going to learn a lot from Jennifer. So I've got Jennifer Domville here with me and Jennifer's from BC and uh, it's a really neat story how we connected but I just want to welcome you to the Carla Rand Show, Jennifer. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Carla. Yeah, I'm you're excited. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you guys probably didn't see, well, you wouldn't have known this, but we actually had a bit of a, <laughs> a problem getting us all connected and ready for this recording. So if we seem a little bit like, whoa, what's going on? It's just we had a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on. But we're gonna we're gonna make it work. I think we're good. Technology um is always a little bit beyond me, but I do have a media guy that just kind of sorts it out. But Jennifer. Um, I was telling, before we hit record, I was just saying how I don't know you really well, but I want to tell our listeners how we got to know each other. So what it was is you kind of reached out to me because you sell skincare products and you reached out to me and, uh, and, and I get people reaching out to me all the time, Jennifer, like every day there's somebody trying to sell me something, right? So I'm just kind of like, whatever. I think I just, maybe I responded really short, but it was like really, the way you presented it was really good, but I'm like, whatever. And then you, like you uh, got back to me and you were, you asked again, like, oh, so you don't want me to order you anything? Like, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And again, I think I kind of blew you off or brushed you off a little bit. And then you just were so persistent and so sweet about it. I was like, okay, okay, this girl like knows her marketing. And because I'm a, I'm a business person, like I have my, my fitness and nutrition business. I really like, I was like, she knows what she's doing. Right. So I was like, wow. And it just really intrigued me. So then we got on the phone and, uh, and it started out like you were just going to talk to me about, you know, some skincare products, (laughs) but I started asking you questions about your life. And we had this long conversation. (laughs) And after that, I'm like, I got to talk, like, I got to talk to this girl. I got to have her on my podcast. So thank you for agreeing to do it because I know that I asked you a lot of questions that were kind of prying and like really trying to get to know your life. And you were so vulnerable, so opening, so sweet. So, um, Um, I just, yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you for being on here, but let's go back, Jennifer. Let's go back. Tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Tell us about your family. And, uh, yeah, just so we can learn. Um, I was born in Ottawa and, uh, spent the first 10 years of my life there. I have an older brother, Tony. He's a couple years older than me. Um, you know, pretty normal childhood, uh, French immersion since I was four. We did lots of camping. Um, my mom was at home. So, you know, she was always present for us, uh, with anything we needed. My dad was in the computer business. It was really just kind of getting out there at that point. So we did have some transfers. We moved, um, from Ottawa to Calgary, where we lived for four years, and then from Calgary to Victoria, BC, where I lived around 14 years, and then um, met my future husband there, and which brought us here to Vancouver, BC. 
But uh, when I look back, I, I do just lots of happy memories. I'm very close to my mom. Um, even to this day, my brother lives like four blocks down the road. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're a tight family. Uh, family is very important to me, always has been. And uh, my parents are no longer together. They haven't been together for over uh, 20 years. But uh, very civil, very hot. Like if you were going to divorce somebody, I think that's how you'd want it. You'd want it to go, mm. you know, yeah. just very civil and still connecting, still together. and. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I had a happy childhood. Good. That's nice. Yeah. So um, what like, what were you like in school? Did you like school, Jen? Did you hate school? Were you a good student? You know what? I was, I was really good in Ottawa and Calgary. And then when we moved to Victoria, I was going into grade nine. So a really transitional year in so many ways. Um, I went in, I knew nobody. I was very nervous. I was uncomfortable in my skin. I was like the only one wearing Calvin Klein jeans and the polo shirt. Like I just, I stuck out like a sore thumb. My last name um, is was spare drop before I got married. So nobody could pronounce it. So I was always on edge. Every time I knew they were getting ready to call my name and you know, it was a really tough transition for me. I was unhappy uh, to leave my friends. I was unhappy to have this move. And because of that, I think I, the first people that accepted me were the ones that were kind of already partying at 14 and already smoking weed, already skipping school. And I was so wanting to be a part of anything um, and not to just be the odd man out that I just kind of succumbed to the friendship immediately and then basically started partying at 14 because I just wanted to belong. Mm. So that was a real pivotal moment for me was at 14. Yeah. Yeah. So what yeah. did that, what did that lead you to? Like you were, did you finish school and did you go on to any post-secondary school or no? Oh yeah. I mean, it wasn't easy. <laughs> I was not a great student. I um, should apologize to every teacher I ever had. Um, I did go back. I, I moved to Vancouver with my boyfriend, who was much older than me when I was uh, 16. And uh, it was just not a great move. I came back and uh, was pregnant young at 19 and went back to finish grade 12 and that was again a pivotal year first time I was ever on the honor roll uh, applying to universities uh, left my then boyfriend which was my daughter's dad and got accepted into the University of Victoria where you know as a single mom I didn't want to put my kid in daycare all day so I started very slow with just three courses and I went all through 12 months of the year and it took me seven years but I did it I got wow. my degree in French and my minor in psychology originally I was going to be a French teacher but then you have a kid and you're like hmm I don't <laughs> think so I don't think that's going to work for me so I did go on and I did get my degree and then kind of found myself in the financial sector yeah for work yeah. And how long did you work in the financial? Like, was that pretty much your whole working life? It was, kinda? Yes, it was my career until we had uh, my son. So my daughter uh, and son are 16 years apart. So when I had my son, it was under my, I, my husband and I had many discussions. And I said, look, when I had my daughter and I was a single parent, I was uh, working full time and raising her and going to school like it just wasn't ideal because the time that we had together it was tough and so I felt we had a bit more of a disconnect whereas with my son I was determined to not have that disconnect and I said I'm, I'm I want to be home until he's five and he goes to kindergarten and then I will return back to work so what? that was the plan that was the plan <laughs> the plan <laughs> so okay so what what happened so you didn't do that then I didn't do that because three years, um, when my son was three, my daughter had her first child. Okay. And at that point, early in, I could see that there was already some issues. And so I had been very adamant with her on, do not have any more kids. You're struggling with this one. And lo and behold, 
became grandbaby number two. Mm. So before I could return back to work, it just so happened that the grandkids came into our care and they were very young. I mean, we'd had them since they were babies, but they were placed with us as a safe home, very young. And so I made the decision not to return back to work because my presence in their lives was much more important. It was a very difficult transition for everybody, for them, for my son, for my husband, uh, that I just felt I had to be at home. Mm. Yeah, wow, that's a big story. Let's let's go back to when you were a single mom and you were trying to get through school with a new baby. How did that go? Because I had a similar thing. I wasn't a single mom, but my husband and I got married and went to university. We had three years of school left to become teachers. And before my final year, I found out I was pregnant. So I had to finish my last year with all my practicums and stuff with this new baby. And it was not easy. Um, how did you manage? Did you have like a parent or something around that kind of helped with the kid? Or, or how did you do it? No, I was I was living in university housing. And I mean, it wasn't easy. There was a you, you kind of go through a lot of emotions. Everyone's out there partying or they're going on these trips or they're doing all these things throughout the week. And I mean, I couldn't. I, I had my my daughter and at night I was trying to get all my homework done and trying to be a parent to her and do the basic things that you want to do. The swimming lessons, the gymnastics, the riding the bikes, the beaches together, like whatever we could do and afford together. Um, I still remember having to write uh, one of my exams with my daughter on my lap because I didn't have anywhere to bring her. And they were very, very good and open about my situation. Um, UVic, all the instructors were amazing. And they gave me, you know, extensions if needed. And they understood. I mean, the priority was my daughter, but I was also trying to educate myself to better myself. But I mean, it was hard. Mm. It, which is why it took me seven years. It was just a very long process, but I think just such a great feeling was my daughter videotaping me when she was seven as I'm walking across the stage <clears throat> of UVic to get my degree. I mean, I just felt at that point, it was just so worth it. And her saying, I want to be like you, mommy. Mm. And, uh, you know, I always wanted her to be her own person, but I did hope in some ways that she would see the perseverance that I had and push through, mm. you know, in order to succeed because it, it wasn't easy. But I mean, if it was like we all say, everyone would do it. Mm -hmm. But yes, the struggle was real. <laughs> the struggle was real. Wow. I just remember writing this 10 page French paper and I, on my computer, they were the size of small vehicles back then. And I had <laughs> to hand write all my accent aigus and, and accent oh. graves. And I got up in the morning and she had drawn on all my work. And, you know, it was just moments like that where it's like, oh, I can't do this. But then it's like, no, yes, I can. So I just handed it in like that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is what you're getting today. So, I mean, <laughs> lots of ups and downs. And, but in the end, I mean, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's just, uh, yeah, that would be really hard. So how long was your degree supposed to be? So it took you seven years. How long was it supposed to be? I'm curious. Four. Four years. Okay. <laughs> And it yeah. took you seven. I should be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's like, why didn't you quit, Jen? Like, why didn't you just say enough? Like, why did you keep doing it when it's so hard? Um, you know what? I'm somebody that if I say I'm going to do something, I mean, I'm going to do it. And when I was around eight months pregnant, I went in to see this doctor and told her, what I was planning on doing. And she turned to me and said, you going to university and getting a degree would be like you going to the Olympics and winning a gold medal. And I thought, oh, so of course I left bawling and my mom was, you know, what's happening and what, what did she say? And is everything okay with the baby? And, and it was people like that, that I just thought, F you. Mm. Okay. <laughs> like that yeah. even makes me want to do it more. Yeah. And I, I I I've like always that. had it in my heart to go back to find that lady and say, don't kill anyone else's dreams because mm -hmm. you were a hundred percent wrong with me. You will be a hundred percent wrong with so many others. And I just hope that people don't follow suit and believe your word because, you know, it was, it was a push for me. Actually at year five, my mom even said, my God, why don't you just quit? And I just thought, what the hell? No, I'm not mm -hmm. going to. And then of course, like, if my brother can do it. <laughs> So can I. <laughs> yeah. Because he also got his degree at UVic, got his degree in French and urban yeah. economics. And 
but I just wanted to do it because so many people felt that I couldn't. Yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. a bit of a, I'll show you kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm like that too. It's like, if people say that I can't, I'm probably going to try even harder. <laughs> so, exactly. so just tell me I can't. Like if you don't want me to yeah. do or if you, you know, like just say I can't and I'll, I'll be there. So I totally understand that. I think everybody's motivated in a different way, but that's definitely how I am. And I think just to kind of have the confidence, like I must, you and I must somehow have the confidence to know that even if somebody says no, we can figure out a way to make it happen. So absolutely. do you know, like when you look back now, do you know where you got that drive from? Like, where did you get this? Like, I'm going to do it anyways. Where did you get that kind of, yeah, just that drive to just do what you want to do? Do you know? Like, was it something from when you were young? Like, where did that come from? I, I don't know. I mean, my dad was always driven and he was always successful in everything he kind of put his hands on. And, I, you know, I've always been very stubborn and just determined to prove people wrong, I think. And mm. I, I just feel... I, you know, I wasn't always strong. I really did lack self-confidence, especially in high school. I had terrible skin and, you know, I would hide behind my hair and wear tons of makeup. I was teased relentlessly. And so it, I think just with all those struggles, it just made me stronger, stronger. And then being able to be a single parent, being able to graduate from university, just pushing myself through all those things, just all those steps mm -hmm. have just kind of made me the strong woman that I am today because mm. I've been able to overcome things that many can't or that I wasn't even sure that I could myself just because I'm so determined and you know if I say I'm going to do it I'm going to do it and I'm mm. going to do it well you know mm. I'm going to be up there I'm not going to be down here okay so you had mentioned when we talked earlier that you were an alcoholic so yeah. Can you tell us how that, I mean, you said when you were 14, you started to party. I'm guessing that's where it started. But like, how did you become an alcoholic? And when did you discover, whoa, I am actually an alcoholic. This is going beyond just partying for me. Um, well, yeah, the drinking at 14. Um, and I just, it never reacted well with me. Mm. I was not the same type of drunk as everyone else. The happy, I was very angry, uh, somewhat violent. Uh, very rude. Um, it was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I think it was more in my 20s where I knew in my heart that I was drinking excessively. Mm. Um, I never really came out and said, gee, I think I'm an alcoholic. But I think in my heart, I knew that me having one drink ever was just not even an option. And you know, my husband never really even came out and said, you know, you're an alcoholic, but he did say, you know, there's a definite problem here, but we used to party all the time in the beginning of our, our marriage. Um, but then it was just getting very destructive and, you know, being so sick for days and not being able to function, not being able to care uh, for my daughter, uh, just feeling like I was just being a crappy wife and, making all these empty promises all the time. Like, that's it. That's the last time I'm done and I'm not drinking anymore. And, but then always falling back into, well, I'll just have one and then, you know, we'll just go for dinner and I'll just have the one. And, but it, it never, it never happened like that. So honestly, I think when I lost my job, my high paying job and left mm -hmm. a huge bonus on the table because I had been inebriated at a, um, event and it wasn't the first you know warning uh that was a big a big eye opener for me mm -hmm. big eye opener for me very disheartening um but i think it needed to happen mm. I, I think it needed to happen as just like a kick in the butt so when you that know? happened when you were like okay i'm in trouble here what did you yeah. do were you did you stop right then or did you nope <laughs> <laughs> i didn't yeah. uh because you get over stuff you know, it's like, oh my God, this is terrible. And oh, this, you're, you're so hurt. And, and then you're embarrassed. And then, but then you get back to feeling not bad about stuff. And, mm. and then you kind of slowly get your way back into it. So that sadly was not the defining moment. My husband telling me our marriage won't work if this continues wasn't the defining moment. Me having kids, um, well, before my son, but with my daughter, even that wasn't a defining moment for me, even though I know I'd embarrassed her on more than one occasion. It was when my son was maybe five months old 
and my husband was away on business and I took the baby monitor and a bottle of wine over to my neighbors. We were in townhouse, so they were attached to us and we had partied over there. And then I came, stumbled back home and grabbed my son and brought him up to my bed and, and passed out. And then the next morning, feeling like garbage, here I'm doing the dishes in the sink and I look up and I see two police officers walking towards my door. And I just thought, oh my God, they're coming to take my baby. They're coming, they, they found out that, like I was, I don't even know why I was thinking that, but I thought they, they found out that I left him next door and I only had the baby monitor and I was drinking and they've come to take the baby. Mm. And they walked towards me and then they turned and went another way. And at that moment, I just went, I'm done. And I felt, it's the first time I felt, felt it. Like I actually, it was like a switch. And I felt it in my soul, like deeper than I've ever felt anyone. And I knew that that was it. And that was it. It's been almost 15 years and I've never touched a drink of alcohol since. Wow. Wow. So if you did touch a drink of alcohol, like you just knew that you just would never go there again because you knew that it was just not, not going to happen. It would just lead Absolutely. you down the wrong path. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. The fear of them coming to take my son, that was it for me. Yeah. That was it. Even though that didn't happen, that was it. I just, uh, I just flipped that switch. And even when I told my husband, when he came back, he said he could see, could see that that was it. Hmm. So I don't know what it was, but I felt it. He saw it. Just that resolve. Hey, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Well, good for yeah. you. I mean, that's a you know, I, and I'm hope that if any of our listeners are hearing this and they have an alcohol problem, that they will be able to say, you know, like, th this is, this is it. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. So what would you say to somebody who is struggling? And maybe they're like, well, that's fine for you, Jen, but like, I'm in the thick of this and this is really hard and I don't know how I'm going to overcome. What would you say to them? Or maybe they know somebody that's, you know, drinking and stuff. What would you say to somebody who's in the middle of, you know, being an alcoholic, they're drinking all the time. They can't seem to shake it. They've tried. What would you tell them based on your experience? You know what? It's really hard to tell people anything. My girlfriend um, is a raging alcoholic. And I've tried to talk to her on many occasions where I would say, oh, I, you know what? I used to do the exact same thing when I was an alcoholic. And But she, unless they see it and unless they want it, mm -hmm. it's not really something that you can force on anybody what I can say to people is that the other side is amazing mm. it is amazing I always thought well I'm going to be missing out if I'm not drinking at this party and I'm going to be missing out at the backyard here and I'm going to be missing out no you're missing out when you're drinking you are missing everything mm. but everything is so clear when you're not and it is so much better on the other side that I always feel so sad when I hear terrible stories where people have lost everything or they've died or because of alcoholism, because they never got to experience how great life is when you eliminate that one evil, mm. if you can eliminate that one evil, but you really, it has to be so personal and it has to be so ready. And that's the same thing. Like with my daughter, I mean, I'm, people have always said, my God, I'm so surprised you haven't started drinking again with everything you've been through mm. uh, with your daughter. But because I haven't, that even solidifies even more that I will never go back and that nothing will push me there. So it really has to be not only an internal strength, but if you can find strength from others who are going through the same thing as you. I've seen a lot of success for people who attend groups on Facebook groups, personal AA meetings. Like there's so many outlets now that are available that you just need to find that one that you really connect with. And, you know, I mean, it's just, I just want it for so many people because I just know how great it is mm. when you do stop and how amazing you feel to not have to apologize to people, to not wonder what you did the night before, to not feel crappy and being vomiting for days. Like, man, it's life changing, mm. life changing. Yeah. 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 I've never drank. Like, I think I had a little bit of wine at a wedding or something, but I guess I've just seen 
the damage that alcohol can do. And there was times in my life where I just realized, I don't know if you believe in the addictive personality thing, but I just feel like there's a lot of things that I do that I tend to get, like I'm very driven and I just, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go all in. So alcohol was one thing I thought I was scared of it. I was like, I don't even want to go there because I know where that could lead if, you know, so for me, I just didn't want to be around it because of that. Um, and of course, hearing stories like yours, right? So I never experienced being drunk or throwing up and all that kind of stuff, thankfully. But I know a lot of people who have, and it's a horrible path. And so I think it's neat for you to say like, yeah, you're missing out. It's not that you're going to miss out if you stop, you're going to miss out if you continue, you know? So. Absolutely. I mean, you don't remember anything. So how are you having fun? Yeah. It's when you're really present that you can really enjoy every moment. And to have no regrets is a really freeing feeling. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, you've talked about your daughter. Um, I know, you you know, your daughter's gone through some really hard things and you've walked with her on some really, really hard things. I think it would be helpful for our listeners if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know your daughter had issues with addiction, um, has issues with addiction. And uh, yeah. there's not really a happy ending here. Um, and there's a lot of people, parents whose kids are in addiction. So do you want to just share a little bit about your journey with that, how that went for you? And uh, if you're if sure. you're okay to share that, I know it's really hard. Oh, you know what? It's, it's, it's what it is. I yeah. mean, I, I can't really change what's happened, but you know, it's kind of sad because, you know, everything was very like, I think we were on par with life with her when, she was even a teen. She was still at home. She was on the cheerleading up at the high school. She was a good girl. And then one day this girl came to our door who had moved away and uh, they reconnected. And the moment that happened, I pretty much lost my daughter at that point. She left, went and lived at this her mom's this other mom's house and I had gone there uh, eight months pregnant uh, pleading her to please make my daughter leave because she was 16 so I had no rights at that point it had to be this mom kicking my daughter out and she refused she refused um, you know she felt my daughter was good for her daughter and I just thought okay it was a it, it was very stressful it was a terrible battle uh, at that point she just kept getting into these volatile, relationships one after the other uh beaten abused um alcohol drugs and then it got to the point where she met somebody and heroin was introduced mm -hmm. and when that happened years ago i i really felt i lost her um you know i i never really knew where she was like i could never really get in contact with her and when she did reach out it was just for money and then when i would have her over here she would steal my stuff and my jewelry and whatever she could get her hands on. And it was always the denial. And, uh, you know, at this point, the kids, the kids were with us and, you know, my daughter, it was so severe. She was on life support three times for over 72 days total. Mm. Uh, the third time the doctor did tell me that he did not feel she would pull through that there was just too much damage. Um, she did, but she's very, uh, sick inside her, her lungs and, She's like an 80 year old inside and a 30 year one, one year old on the outside. And so we thought, OK, maybe this last time, you know, maybe this was this was what she needed. I mean, if this isn't rock bottom, I have no idea what is. And so she was willing to go into a program. But then she left, you know, before it ended, she didn't complete it. And again, she went back with the same guy and just went right back in to the same situation. So. The life support was very hard uh, for me. You're holding your kid's hand. They really look like they're dead. Um, you know, I mean, there's no life to them. She wasn't breathing on her own. She was 100% um, on a breathing device. She was on a paralytic. And it's exhausting and it's trying and you're afraid that this is the end. Um, and then when you see them go back after that, you know, I felt myself personally I had to take two steps back and say, you know, I have to look out for me because I'm faltering, I'm weakening, I'm struggling and it's affecting my family. And I need to unfortunately harden myself uh, with my love to her because I'll always love her and I'll always be her mom, but I can't allow that to take over my whole entire life. I still have 
three kids. I mean, mm-hmm. 15, 12 and nine, you know, so it, it, it's, it's been very, very difficult. And even, you know, she texted me yesterday and it's not, how are you? How are the kids? It's, I need money, you know? And I said, you know, I, I, I just gave you money a couple of weeks ago. I, I just can't because am I giving you money for the food? Like you say, or am I giving you money for heroin? Like, you know, but then as a mom, you kind of have that little bit of a guilt, like, okay, well, if you need a place to stay, then I will give you some money. And we've tried to take her and her girlfriend in here. We've tried on multiple occasions, but it just hasn't worked. And it's been really detrimental for the kids. So yeah, I've, I've taken my steps back. I'll always be here, but honestly, I find myself waiting for that knock on the door and the terrible news that she's gone because I'm pretty confident I'll be burying my daughter before, before I go. Mm. Wow. Wow. (laughs) So what would you say then? Um, I mean, I understand why you have to step back. Like there's no way that you can, because I think when you're dealing with an addict, it's not a, it's not a typical scenario. It's not like, oh, there's my daughter and I want to be her mom. And I, it's, she's an addict now. So that means that she's not making decisions based on what's best for her. She's not like thinking clearly. She's not doing the things that a daughter would do with a mom. She's thinking about her addiction. She's thinking of how she's going to get that next hit. Right. So yeah. for you, it's like, you, like, I can see why you have to take a step back. What would you say to those moms though? And maybe dads, but particularly moms who, who maybe they're at the cusp, but they're kind of like, I just don't want to do that. Like, I just don't want to do that. It's too hard. I, I, I just always want to have hope for my kid and I want to keep helping them. What would you say to somebody like that? Who's just really struggling right now and they haven't gotten to the point of just stepping back. Well, I'll never give up hope. Um, there's always that in the back of the mind, but I don't, I don't rely on the hope Mm -hmm. that things are going to change because there's just been too many disappointments. I mean, it, it, it is so hard to take on that addiction. It is so trying. It affects everybody. The ripple effect is huge. It's not just my family. It's my mom and my dad and, and all of the people that are affected. I mean, it's, it's really hard for me to give advice because I'm still here in the thick of it and we haven't found resolve. And, but for me, I did have to harden myself and step back because I have kids under my care and I need to ensure and do everything I can. Not that I didn't with her, but I I need them to see that I'm going to do everything I can to ensure they don't follow down that same path. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, you want to say, stay strong. You want to, you want to be there for them, but you can't do anything until they're ready to make any sort of change. So you can hold out on hope. And I think, you know, I don't think we should ever give up hope. I mean, you never know things do come around, things do happen, but just don't rely on that change happening until that person is a hundred percent ready. Cause you can't force them to go into recovery. You can't force anything with addicts. You just can't, it has to be their own decision and it's a waiting game. And you just hope that they make that decision before they, before they overdose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I feel for, I feel for anybody that's going through it because it's been a tough 15 years for us. You know, even though you try to harden yourself, it's, it's in your subconscious. It affects my sleep. It's what I think about before I go to bed. It's what I think about. Where's my daughter when I wake up? So, you know, it's, it's definitely there, but I just try to compartmentalize that and, you know, deal with what I have in front of me right now, because that's really all I have control over and, and can handle. I mean, I'm 50 mm-hmm. and I'm feeling like I'm aging at a rapidly <laughs> quick pace here, <laughs> but still having one in elementary school for crying out loud. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we're, we all just do the best we can, but you know, in the end, it's up to them. It's up to them. Right. Yeah. So what does your life look like now, Jen? What does your day look like? What do you do? You're looking after these kids. You've got your, uh, your home business. What, is, what does that look like? How's that working for you? Uh, well, I love my home business. I mean, this, uh, I mean, as you know, I'm with Rodan and Field and it has absolutely changed my skin beyond my expectations. So for me, sharing that gift with others is just, 
I love doing it. And I love having people message me and they're so happy. And so I really, I work my business in the morning and my afternoons are spent with the kids. So before COVID, maybe I knew something was coming because we got an above ground pool and we got our whole backyard set up. And so really the afternoons I spend, I spend with the kids. My son's a teen, he's 15. So I usually have a brood of boys uh, downstairs in the house and kids in the pool. And I mean, it's for me, I mean, COVID has been terrible for so many, uh, for us, it's just tightened us as a family. You know, it's, it's been such, it's so nice to have my husband home and for us to be able to have lunch together and for just all of us to be able to play a game randomly in the middle of the day. So, you know, my days are work and family, work, family, home. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the same with me here too. And actually COVID is when I started this podcast. So I had oh, been wow. wanting to do a podcast for a while. And then uh, when, when COVID hit, I was like, oh my goodness, like I can actually do this now because I don't have to be here, 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 and here. And I can actually take the time to figure this out. And uh, my media guy was game to do it. So that's kind of how this came. So I think that, you know, with COVID definitely there's, you know, people talk about all the negative stuff, but there's some pretty positive things that have come out of it as well. So absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. (laughs) So what's your, what's your game plan going forward? What's your, you got three boys then at home with you? I know my son is uh, 15. Uh, He's at football practice right now. My grandson is 12 and my granddaughter is nine. Okay. Oh, so you do have one granddaughter. Yeah. Fingers crossed they go back to school in September (laughs) because homeschooling was interesting. Wasn't it though? Yeah. 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 It was interesting. I always say, if you know anything about the industrial revolution, ask me, I got you covered. (laughs) Well, good for you for figuring figuring that all out. So what do you like about business? Because that's really what connected us in the first place was like, you obviously, you've got some serious business skills, Jen. (laughs) So how did you get those skills and what do you like about having your own business? Honestly, I learned as I went, I came into this business greener than green. Um, I was not confident when I first started, but I wasn't someone who was going to ask the same questions over and over again. So I just figured it everything out on my own. Um, and I think just by doing that, started to build a little bit of confidence, knowing that I didn't need help from, you know, this person or this person, or this person that I could figure it. I don't need them to tell me when to do something. I'll just do it on my own. And sharing well I mean, what's been great about it is I get to meet people like you I mean I would have never met you um had I not reached out and and I've made so many great friends this way mm. um you know I mean and I love to meet people for coffee I think for me I've just become such a social person and I never really was that before like you put me in a group of people where I didn't know anyone and I was like oh my god they're coming to come to talk to me oh no back away back away but now I'm just I just feel great in my skin. It could just be, you know, you age, you get mature, you get more comfortable, you don't care what people think, but it's it's just been life-changing for me in so many ways from the friendships that I've made. I mean, I never even see myself as busy sa- business savvy. I just know what would need to be done if you're trying to build the clientele and bring on partners. I mean, a follow-up and reaching out and touching base and meeting and these types of things are key. Mm. It's a people's, it's a people business. Yeah, you know, It's all about relationships. So um, for me, I love it. And I just love the feedback that I get from clients, people that are happy, people that haven't, are not wearing makeup for the first time in 10 years. Like things like that just make me feel really good about what I do. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think it's so like often when people reach out to me, like on messenger or whatever, I kind of am like, okay, you know, what's going on now? What are they going to do? Right. And so like, just kind of seeing like, how are they going to talk me to how persistent are they? Right. And I mean, maybe it sounds like I'm being manipulative or I'm being, you know, kind of tricky or, or frustrating. I'm probably not the greatest client, but it's like, it's just interesting for me to watch. And so I was like, okay, this Jennifer, like, she's totally just going to like stop. Cause like, I'm just, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, I'm kind of interested. And then I'm not really doing anything. And like, I was just so busy at that time. 
And so I just was like, oh, yeah, right, right, right. But you just kept going after me, going after me. And I ended up buying some stuff from you. And uh, yeah. and I always figure, like, anybody, like, if I'm going to buy something off of somebody, it's like, for me, it's more than just a transaction. Like, it's like a connection that I feel with somebody. Absolutely. And I just really got that connection with you. So I was just so happy that you said, yeah, I'll go on the podcast. And I know that I don't think you've ever been on a podcast. This is all new for you, isn't it? Never. Yeah. Never. Because then I was like, this isn't video, is it? No. <laughs> I should brush my hair. <laughs> I know you're like talking to me, but I mean, I just did two workouts this morning. And so like, you know, and I was actually kind of like putting my hair down and realized I had big knots in it and stuff, but I'm like, whatever. And so when you were, I said, just put a hat on or something, but yeah, like, so I think five minutes, I think maybe you had a couple of minutes. Cause you thought I, yeah, you're probably, I don't know when your jammy shirt or whatever. And so yeah, you're like, I oh my that. goodness. Yeah. Right. But I mean, <laughs> you did it. You made it happen again. You made it happen. Right. You just were like, yeah. we're here. Let's do this. So I, yeah, I, that's really what, what, uh, connected us. I think it's just like, I saw your drive and I saw like that you really seemed to care. Like you were able to make that connection with me just on messenger in such a powerful way. And then after our conversation, I was like, yeah, this girl, like, I'm going to, I'm going to buy something from her. I got to buy something from her. So yeah. So that was awesome. Now I want to wrap up this podcast, but is there any last words that you have for us based on your experience through your life with your alcoholism, with your daughter, with your business, anything that you would say to our listeners to kind of maybe encourage them or inspire them in any way? Oh boy. I'm kind of putting you in the Eek. spot here. If you don't, um, that's fine. Well, I mean, I think I'm a real example of anything is possible. I mm. mean, it's amazing how resilient we are and how much we can forge forward no matter how many barriers are trying to stand in our way. I mean, for me with alcoholism and and uh, with my daughter and with taking in my grandkids and being a single parent in university. I mean, there was a lot of doors that I could have kept closed, but I think mindset and just perseverance and just trying to be the best version of myself is what has continued for me to just kick down those doors out of my way and just, you know, live my life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing when you get my age, you realize how quickly life goes and then you have kids and it's like it's it's almost scary so I mean you, you can't solve everybody's problems but I always just say I'm just I'm just always trying to become a better person every day for mm. myself it's always self-improvement and I just want you know the best for people really I mean I've, I've got a very kind heart and if anyone ever wanted to talk about anything that has touched them in this podcast I mean I'm on Facebook, Jennifer Donville. I'm on Instagram, jdonville69. And I'm always open to connecting because I know that if I can do it, that there's, you know, I'd like to say so can you. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like I was a lighter alcoholic or, I mean, I was the hardcore. So I just, if there's anything I can do for anybody, I'd love to be able to help, assist, talk, mm. share, whatever, whatever I could do. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm there for people. Thank you. Yeah. So the best place for people to find you then, you already kind of shared it, but just where would be the best place? Facebook? Would that be the best place to connect with you? Yeah. I mean, if they message me on Facebook and then I could give them my phone number and we could connect that way. I always prefer getting on the phone. I just think it's more personal. And, and then the conversations become more in depth, I think, when you actually have that yeah, that one-on-one. -on -one. So absolutely, if they message me, then I, I am more than happy to chat with them because if there's anything I can do to help, I would love to be able to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being on here. It's been fun just to get to know you better too in this conversation. And I hope that it will be, well, I know that it will be helpful for a lot of people who are struggling with these different types of addictions and that kind of stuff. Cause I mean, we all, we all have our struggles. We all have the things that we need to overcome and it's really neat to hear your story. Cause that's tough, some tough stuff. And there's not a happy ending at this point, right? For some of this, yes, you stopped the alcohol, but your daughter's still struggling to know that you can continue. Yeah. You can have a successful, successful business. You can, you know, raise these kids, these grandkids and keep going and connect with people and care so much and continue to live this life even though there's some things that aren't resolved, even though you're in the midst of a lot of pain and you talk about that in the morning and at night, right? And so I think that would be a lot of hope for people who are, the pain isn't ending. They're, they're struggling. Maybe they have chronic pain. Maybe they have this other kind of trauma with, with family or whatever. But like to know that you can continue and you do need to sometimes, like you said, put those walls up in order to protect yourself and your family. 
And I think you you can still carry on. It, things don't always just go away. There's not always this like happy, happy ending. But I mean, look at you. Look what you're doing, right? And the impact you're making on your family. Like that's incredible. So thank you so much, Jennifer. It's been wonderful to have thank this co- so conversation. Much. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by my company, Power Fitness Online. We are a tight-knit fitness community, and we guide you every step of the way to get fit and stay fit through our live workouts, nutrition coaching, and incredible support team. Go to powerfitnessedson.com to learn more. Thank you for tuning into the podcast today. If you enjoyed it, please leave a positive review on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, or wherever you're listening. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I would love to see your comments. I would love to know what you think about this episode and uh, interact with you. I love hearing from you. Once again, I'm Carla Rand, and this is The Carla Rand Show. And I can't wait to see you next week for our next episode.